Hey guys, and welcome to the Assistant Editor Crash Course. My name is Joel, and I'm a film and television editor based in Toronto, Canada. Just to be clear, this course will not teach you how to edit. I think most of you likely already have a firm understanding of how editing works, and googling for a tutorial on a specific function is pretty quick. Instead, this course revolves around solving a problem. It's not that you can't learn how to use a tool to be an assistant editor. It's that it's really difficult to figure out, well, what you need to know to become one. So instead, the material will set you up to know and understand what will be asked of you day to day so that you can bring focus to the what you need to be job ready. While context and a strong foundation is paramount, it can also be overwhelming when we're on slide 34 and still going over video codec history. So my goal here is to get you to see the big picture as quickly as possible. The course is going to be structured in this way. Part one, we're just going to do a overview of the production workflow. And this will allow us to find where the assistant editor basically is situated. And then part two will be an exploration of the assistant editor's three areas of responsibilities. And these are ingest, assist, and conform. Finally, as a wrap up, we'll look at the traits of a great assistant editor and some possible next steps to help you out. In addition to watching each of the lessons, I would also check the text counterpart because there is some additional information available there. And with all that out of the way, let's get started. Let's explore a basic version of the path that every live action production takes. Your average moviegoer will be somewhat familiar with these jobs and tasks, but it's a great starting point to make sure we're all on the same page here. In pre-production, you have essentially everything that goes into the planning and the designing of the film or episode. From writing the script, or in reality TV, a treatment, crewing up, running meetings for each department, rehearsals, finding locations to shoot, and working studios, etc, etc. Production is the most obvious stage of the process, the actual filming part. This is a tremendously expensive part of the process as it involves so many people being employed at the same time and an enormous amount of work and logistics that have to be carried out. Post-production encompasses combining all the elements that were captured on set, assembling it in the best way possible, and then enhancing it via VFX, color grading, sound editing and mixing, and of course music. This is the part of the process where the assistant editor will be brought on. Post-production itself is broken up into two distinct phases, the offline edit and the online edit. We'll talk about that later. Lastly, we arrive at the delivery stage of the workflow, where the final deliverables are sent off for exhibition, whether that be to the theaters, a broadcast network, or a streaming platform. Each will have its own specifications. Now, let's take a closer look at the assistant editor's place in this workflow. While the production stage involves sometimes hundreds of people doing their best work, when it comes to passing the baton to post-production, it's all getting funneled into just three items, which go through the assistant editor. One, the footage, referred to as rushes or dailies. Two, the audio files, or audio rushes. And three, the paperwork which includes the daily production reports, the continuity report, line scripts, and editor logs. From there, the assistant editor will transcode, sync, ingest, and organize the footage before passing it on to the editor. The editor will of course assemble the footage as best they can, and with feedback from the directors and producers, will put together the rough cut and then the fine cut, all the while relying on their assistant editor for support. Finally, with everyone signing off, picture lock will be reached. This is certainly a milestone, but not the finish line. At that point, the assistant editor will take the picture lock and prepare to send it off to the various teams, VFX, sound, composers if they're involved, and to the online editors. The online editors will take all these final elements and put them together in a final high resolution package for the final deliverable. Now, unless you're working on a much lower uh, budget project, there is a step before the assistant editor that is usually in place, and that is the post lab or post facility. They will be the ones who actually receive the camera rushes and the sound rushes, and they can combine them, back it up, transcode and sync it, and then deliver that to the assistant editor. They'll also be the ones then on the back end who are conforming the edit, but don't worry if that's not really making any sense right now. We will go into further detail in a later lesson. For now, it should be coming clear that the assistant editor, though under the editor, is overseeing the post team 
and is a gatekeeper of sorts for the incoming media and the outgoing media. It's easiest to think of the assistant editor's responsibilities as falling under one of three categories. The first being ingest, the second being assist, and the third conform or prep for conform. Now, there's quite a bit happening in each area of responsibility or stage. So let's take a closer look at each one of these one by one. So the first area of responsibility for the assistant editor is ingest. Ingest is an umbrella term, and it encompasses a number of separate tasks. These include transcoding, importing, syncing, grouping and multicamming, and the labeling, logging, and organization of all the footage. The ingest process begins with transcoding, so let's start there. Again, on smaller productions, this would fall under the assistant editor's role, but on a show with even a medium budget, this is now carried out by the post facilities. Nonetheless, understanding the process is integral to the assistant editor's job. So what is transcoding? Today, the digital cinema cameras being used in both feature and television projects are capable of a tremendous amount of detail being captured. Everyone wants to capture as much as possible for both the best image, but also for future VFX work and the option to reframe or crop in in the edit if needed. However, this results in the camera's generator files, the footage, being enormous. And just as a note, it's not just the resolution of the file, whether that's HD, 2K, 4K, 6K, or even 8K. It's bitrate and color information as well. To simply play back and view these files takes a considerable amount of processing power. So to edit with them is excruciating. It would basically bring any prosumer computer to its knees and makes sharing files back and forth far too time consuming and requiring an enormous amount of storage. So if you can't edit the files that you just shot, well, what do you do? That's where transcoding comes in. Transcoding in this context is the process of taking those super high quality files and making a lower resolution copy with the exact same metadata attached to it. This is also known as making a proxy or a proxy workflow. These proxy files are a fraction of the size of the original camera files. And because they're using a edit friendly codec like Avid's DNX HR or Apple's ProRes, they perform much better on the edit timeline as well, requiring far less CPU power behind them. So the editor will use these files to make their creative assemblies and then the rough cuts and the fine cuts until they get to picture lock. Once you have picture lock, you're going to use that as the blueprint, but it's not the final deliverable. It's just too low quality. You want to be using the higher quality files as the basis for color correction, VFX work, and ultimately to be used as what's shared with the broadcasters or the network. So you need a way to relink to the original high resolution files. This process is known as conforming. And you're able to do the relink by using the metadata. Metadata is kind of like a fingerprint that describes the date and time a file was recorded, the camera memory card it came from, and the exact time code that ran during the duration of the clip. So it's very important when you're transcoding down to retain all this metadata information because that will be the basis for how you relink for the online edit. Okay, so just to quickly recap, when we're talking about transcoding, we're talking about taking video from one format into another. In this context, we're talking about a proxy workflow, which means lowering the quality, resolution, and bitrate, which requires far less storage, and using an intra-frame codec, which requires far less CPU power. Usually, in an Avid workflow, you'll be using transcoded or proxy media such as Avid's own DNX HD36 or Apple's ProRes 422 proxy. On to the second stage of ingest, the import. If you use a popular non-linear editing system like Premiere or Final Cut, you may have the habit of simply dragging and dropping your video clips from wherever they live on your computer directly onto the project. That's okay for a quick solo project, but it's a non-starter in the professional world. Media must be kept in a highly organized format. Whether you're using Avid or not, your organization system needs to be super readable and easy to follow. 
Avid is unique among the NLEs in that half of this work is done for you by nature of its design. Now, half, what does that even mean? When importing, Avid needs its own copy of the media. It's always stored in one central location, a folder called Avid Media Files. This folder lives on the root or the top level of the hard drive or network drive that you're working from. Secondly, within this folder, all media that's imported will be placed in a specific .mxf container or wrapper. That's opposed to maybe the more popular ones you know, such as .mov, .mp4, or .avi. So for example, if on our desktop we had a clip of the Toronto skyline and we had imported that into Avid, and we'll just see what that looks like, it's the exact same clip. The thing is, it's not the desktop clip that's being referenced right now. Avid has made its own copy in Avid Media Files, MXF, 1, and then there's a unique uh, name given to its own clip version of it. And you can see it's a .mxf file as well. Now, why did I say that Avid will only half do the organizational job? Well, the Avid Media Files folder is a continual work in progress. Whenever you import a file into Avid, as we saw, it goes into Avid Media Files, MXF, and then it will always go into a folder called number one. And if you never change this name of the folder, every single clip that you added would go into it, which can get very confusing when it's been weeks of footage coming in and they all just live in folder one. So usually what happens is the assistants will close the folder by naming it uh, the date and then the shoot day number to indicate exactly what footage lives inside of it. So um, this was shoot date 00 because it was before principal photography started. Uh, but they gave the date, they gave the shoot date, and that closes the folder to only contain this imported media on this day. The second thing to remember is that Avid does not necessarily take care of the organization and storage of the camera originals. Now, this is dependent on the exact workflow, but traditionally, Avid only organizes and stores these offline lower resolution media in the Avid Media Files folder. You will still need to manually store the high resolution original clips in a way that allows the conform process, aka the relink process, to be executed smoothly. So let's take a quick look at the process to import a file. So you're going to go to your bin that you want the file, you go to import, you go to input, and then you go to source browser, and you go to where the footage lives. Usually you're going to have the originals on some sort of folder structure that goes camera originals, footage, the shoot date, and then the card. Uh, in this case we have our um, Toronto skyline again and you can link it or you can import it. Now, I did say that Avid is unlike Premiere and Final Cut in that you can't just reference the file wherever it, it was currently stored on your computer, whether that be like my documents or your desktop. And that is true in that you should not be editing from a file that's being referenced that way. The preferred method of editing in Avid is that you do not link and then edit with the linked files. You link to the camera originals so that you can then transcode and make the proxies that would live inside the Avid Media Files structure. And then once you are done editing with the proxies, you would link back to the camera originals. Now you'll see that there is a link option and in addition to that there is also an import option. The import option essentially expedites this process. You go straight from the file that's on your desktop and you go right into the Avid Media Files uh, folder. And it sort of makes a edit friendly version of it. But if you do it this way, you are breaking the ability to then link back to the higher res version of it. So it is important that we go with link. So let's go ahead and start that process. So let's link it and you'll see that the file now exists here. And this is the file. And it plays back great. 
but you do not want to edit with a file that is linked. And you can see the small little chain, chain link icon there. You do not want to edit this way. So essentially what you have to do is transcode now. And how do you do that? You right click, you go to consolidate and transcode, and you make sure the transcode option is selected, and you choose where it's gonna go, and you choose your target video resolution, which as I said before, is a much more edit friendly format. So you have DNX HDs, you have, uh, usually you have ProRes as well. Oh, there you got ProRes as well. But we're just gonna go DNX HD LB. Then you click transcode. And there you go. Now you see the icon is slightly different. It does not have the chain uh, the chain link there as well, but if we click it, it's the same clip. The only thing that's different about the name is it has a dot new and then the uh, dot zero one as well. So where does this clip live now though? Does it live on the desktop? No, this file, the proxy that's been made, lives in the Avid Media Files folder. It lives under the MXF. It lives in the newly created one folder which is where anything that's newly created will be. So this is a very simplified transcoding process. I did not show you how to add some extra metadata, usually in the form of something called a disk label. And usually you would not be doing this, you know, clip by clip. You'd be doing many clips at the same time um, and sort of batch processing it. Uh, but I will link to a more in-depth tutorial on just that process uh, in the text version of this lesson. But that is the basics of how the transcoding process works from within Avid. Now, you may remember that I said the post lab commonly does the transcodes for you. So what exactly does it look like when they have already prepped and delivered the files to you? This is another thing that makes Avid special. You can create and copy Avid Ready files directly into the Avid Media Files folder without going through the Avid application first. So, if someone were to prepare transcoded files for you, they can make it into that MXF format that's Avid friendly all in one go. So you wouldn't have to bring it in separately again and make another copy. So what does that look like? Well, if you're working as an assistant on a scripted show, you might get a transfer drive uh, with the day's footage and it might just come in a folder that's labeled the day as it is, October 29th and you're going to have Avid Media Files, MXF, and let's just say you've already had two days of shooting so far. What you're going to do is you're going to take the October 29th and you're just going to copy it over into, into the MXF folder. The files have been copied over. You may have noticed in the other folders that we have two additional files here, the .pmr and the .mdb. These are both Avid database files that have shown that Avid has indexed whatever is in these two folders. Now I've copied it over and those two files aren't showing up. That's because Avid will not read a new folder unless it's been given just a numerical value. So we're just going to rename it one. I'm going to pop back into Avid. And when we return, you'll see that the .pmr and the .mdb files have both uh, been created. And that just means that Avid has indexed whatever's in this folder now. So we can go ahead and label this uh, to match the, the nomenclature we've already chosen. So October 29th, D03 for the, shoot, for the third shoot date. And that folder is now closed. To bring in the media that you just indexed, all you have to do is make a new bin. Take the MDB file and drag and drop it right into the newly created bin. All the files that were in the folder will now populate in the bin and you are good to go. So just to be clear, if the files are transcoded by yourself from within Avid, then your MXFs 
are already in the Avid Media Files folder. Import done. If the files were transcoded by someone else and handed over to you, likely on a hard drive, then they will need to be copied over into the Avid Media Files folder. This is all a simplification, of course, but as an assistant editor, learning Avid's media management is paramount. It may feel overwhelming at first, but once it clicks, you will find that the central and rigid structure greatly improves organization, especially on massive projects. Okay, let's move on to the third section of the ingest process, which is group and sync. Technically, this is uh, three and four, but uh, they always get referred to that way. And technically, it's sync and then group. So just keep that in mind. So what are we talking about here? Group and sync refers to linking media that was captured separately. The simplest and most common example of this is where audio is recorded externally from the camera. So that means the high quality audio is recorded on another device. In post, therefore, the matching video and audio will need to be synced up and married or grouped together. And when grouped, these appropriately enough are called a group clip. Now, if you had the audio clip and the video clip in a bin together, you could just select them both, right click them, and then choose group clips. But when you have a day's footage to sync and then group, you usually put them all into a timeline. And this timeline is known as a sync map. Each source will get its own tracks, and using time code or in a crunch waveform, you will sync up each video clip to its corresponding audio clip. Now, if there are multiple cameras shooting simultaneously, then in post they will also need to be synced and grouped together. When multiple cameras are grouped together, it is commonly referred to as a multicam clip. So let's go back to what we said about lining up all the sources um, in a sequence, and the sequence is called the sync map. And this is what it looks like within Avid. So you can see on V1 and on A1 to A9, we have camera A, and on V2 and on A11 to A19, we have the media from camera B. Uh, you can tell this because of the last letter in each of the clip names. This has already been synced up. So uh, what happens when we group it? When the multiple angles are grouped together, obviously now they become a multi-cam clip. And you can visually tell in Avid because there is a G next to the clip name, which stands for group. And at any point, if you want to go to the other angle, you simply right click on the clip and you can choose between the two angles that you had, or if you had more angles, you could do that too. This also applies to the audio clips. And the reason you want a group clip in the first place is, well, one, it uh, allows the, the sequence to be far more contained. As you can see, we use half the number of tracks. But two, it's just far more easier for the editor to know uh, that they can quickly check the other angle um, for additional footage of a particular moment. Um, at any given point, and they don't have to go hunting back into a bin to find the matching shot. Okay, let's just jump to the final uh, area under ingest, which is the log, the label, and the organization of the footage. This is the final step uh, before it gets to the editor. And the point here is to label all the shots to include the information from the continuity reports. Uh, and that would include the shot name, the camera used, the description of the shot, and any comments from set, um, as well as the director favorites or circle takes, which they think capture exactly what they're looking for. That's not always the case, but that's a great starting point. So here's an example of a editor's log that came for a specific scene. This is scene uh, 311. And you can see we have take numbers, we have a circled uh, takes that the director liked and then we have uh, some camera information and the description of the shot itself and then some comments from set. The first thing you should do with all these uh, with all the paperwork is to use it as a checklist to make sure that you got everything that was listed here. You have all the footage and nothing fell through the cracks. So that's what you firstly should be using it for. But uh, once you can confirm everything was brought in into the Avid then 
your job is to transfer all this information into the bin for the editor um, so they don't have to look at the paperwork anymore and it's all within the Avid bin. Since there is so much footage coming into a project, it is paramount that it be organized well. The project layout should be clear and concise. Now, every editor works in their own way and has their own preferences, and this includes just the way the bin looks. Some prefer the list view, some prefer the thumbnail view, um, some prefer to have a, a string out of all the day's footage, where others prefer to see the clips as they were standalone. So you should be organizing the entire project in a way that is obvious where each element is so the editor doesn't have to go hunting for it. It should be clear where the music, the SFX, the graphics, the VFX, and any other shots are needed. For a great example of an Avid project structure, you can go ahead and download the attached uh, template. Uh, most editors in Reality TV will work with the day's footage in a long string out sequence where every single clip from the day's shoot is back to back to back. In scripted projects, most editors prefer the thumbnail view, I think. Because I've jumped between the two of them, I've actually enjoyed a bit of a hybrid approach. I really do enjoy having the string out sequences so that I can comb through the entire scene's footage very quickly. But I do like seeing the thumbnails to quickly show me what angles are available when I'm recutting. In both scripted and reality projects, many editors will be expecting markers to be added to the clips. Now they can be used to show the exact moment action was called on set. If you use a spanned marker, you can show the duration of the take. Sometimes the action is reset and there is another take within the same shot. And so you'll want to show that a reset happened. You'll be able to make your own color-coded system, uh, but usually I just use green markers to indicate which are the circle takes from the director. So that was a quick look at the ingest section of the assistant editor's responsibility. And now we'll move on to the assist section, which is a little bit more typical and what you might expect when it came to the job. This can be a far more creative part of the assistant editor job, helping your editor out with whatever they need. This can include creative tasks like helping to build up a rough version of a scene, uh, but it could also just be hunting for SFX or other music cues to try and in the edit. For most assistants, this will feel like the closest they will get to learning the craft or showing off their own editing skills, but it's not a certainty that you'll be given the shot. Let's explore the more traditional part of assistant editing. Your daily tasks will include making selects, importing temp SFX, music, and stock, paper edits and assemblies, and exports. Let's start with the selects. When it comes to directly assisting your editor, making selects is one of the most common requests you'll hear. Selects is just a catch-all term describing a collection of clips that have the best of performance, an angle, a take, a line, a visual, or whatever else. An assistant editor would be expected to create a sequence or a bin containing all these options so that the editor wouldn't have to go hunt them down. Stringouts is a very common term too. It's basically the same thing, except without the best qualifier. It is a collection of everything that possibly fits the bill. Stringouts can also just mean putting any given collection of clips onto a sequence, back to back. You may have noticed in the earlier lesson about label and logging that the sequence with all the takes for scene 3 and 11 was in a sequence called the stringout. In the scripted world, when making selects, you are usually given a fairly contained set of parameters. You may be asked to find all the good options for a certain line delivery in a given scene, or you'll be asked to collect the establishing shots for a given location. In factual or reality television, string outs are relied on more often than selects, because an editor really does have to do the work of scanning for any usable bits. The search parameters can be far more specific and far-reaching. You may be sent on a deep hunt looking for a specific character making any surprised reaction. Guess what? That character was in 13 days of shooting, so you better get hunting. Believe it or not, when you make the selects, pass it on, and eventually see what makes the final cut, you are absorbing good shot selection. So pay attention, because this is one way you'll get a free education. 
equally as common as the request for making selects, assistant editors are tasked with finding or importing temporary or temp options for sound effects, music, and stock footage. And this is a request that's found on the factual reality TV and the scripted side of the industry. So why do you have to do this? Well, many shows will have a library of sound effects or temporary music to try out, but not everything works out when you put it in the cut. So the assistant will have to locate other sound effects or scores online, although ideally this is through licensable avenues. And this is because a producer or a director is bound to fall in love with something that they hear or see, and it really sucks when you realize you're unable to get a license for it for the final cut. In scripted projects, ripping a film soundtrack and giving it a try in your cut is extremely common. Although this is somewhat frowned upon as it kind of puts a lot of pressure on your hired composer to match what is probably a Hollywood budget. In reality television, however, uh, many of the larger productions will have subscriptions to expansive music libraries, such as APM or Universal Production Music. And this allows you to search for many options very quickly. Although the editor might ask the assistant to go hunting for them and make a selects sequence of some great tracks. Now, as a note, unless you are on the largest reality TV productions, normally what happens is the music that's selected in the offline edit and the sound effects that are used are committed all the way to the final broadcast. In scripted content, however, that is not the case. Nearly all the music and sound effects that are used in the offline edit will be thrown away. The sound editors will bring their own sound design with their much higher quality sounds and creative ability. And the composer will bring their own strengths and creative solutions to the piece as well. Okay, so in addition to sound effects and music, the last temp media that you'll be asked to import is stock footage. And stock footage may be used as a temporary measure while waiting for a pickup shot or as the permanent solution. Just like music, the production may have a subscription or licensing deal with one of the major stock footage providers. Um, that would include Getty, Pond5, Shutterstock, or Storyblocks. And usually an assistant is given a description of what the editor is looking for, and it'll be up to the assistant to scour all the stock footage databases and download and ingest any possible options. It does take a, a trained eye to get exactly what the editor is looking for, but as you continually get this request, you will develop that skill and hopefully that'll help cut down the time you're searching and make your editor happy. Sometimes you'll be using stock footage as a means of a temp VFX, but uh, for the most part, you'll be looking for establishing shots, you know, think drone shots over a city, uh, or quick details to help set a montage or a transition sequence, you know, crowds in the street, city life, landscapes. Um, that'll usually be what you're looking for. And hopefully the production has room in the budget for it because the cost does quickly add up. All right, on to number three, paper edits, assemblies, and scene passes. For a lot of you, this, this is the fun part. If you were looking at assistant editing as a stepping stone to being a full-time editor, which clearly isn't the only path, then this is the task that you want to have to be building up your cutting skills. Let's start with reality television, or factual. In addition to the editor, you're also working directly with a story producer, someone who essentially writes the script of reality shows for the editor to piece together. After the footage starts rolling in and is ingested by the assistant, the story producer will watch it all down, ideally within Avid, although often they will also ask you to export a file for them. And then they will make note of all the time codes where they like a line that is said or an interaction that happens. And using all these noteworthy points, they will string together the skeleton of a story arc. They may add options for narration or voiceover. And the collection of these together is what's called a paper edit. And it looks something like this. At this point, the assistant may be requested to assemble the footage in a sequence that exactly matches what's on the paper edit. This includes any title cards for items that have not been shot yet or lines of narration that still need to be recorded. Sometimes the editors may prefer to have a visual of the sequence structure 
they might request that the interviews or main footage live on track B1, while stock footage, B-roll, narration, and title cards are on the video tracks above. This allows them to see the visual makeup of the paper edit. Once you have a rapport with your editor, you can offer to go a step further in terms of developing that paper edit to be closer to an assembly cut, um, because ultimately what you're doing is lessening their workload, um, though you definitely should get clearance first before you jump ahead with that task. In scripted content, there isn't a paper edit. There's just an assembly, which means you're starting to cut the scene. So do your best to assemble the scene and don't get hung up on when it's not clicking. Um, if you get given this task, I would, if you haven't already, examine the sequences of the editor's rough work um, just to get a taste for how they've assembled uh, their sequences, the rough assemblies, and the kind of pacing, the choices they make, uh, music pass they do as well. And you can also ask the editor for their preferences on how they want you to work. Are you cutting using only the circle takes? Are you doing a full music and SFX pass for them? Um, do they want it super tight so that it plays um, almost like a polished scene and they get to watch it that way? Or do they want you just to essentially assemble the best takes and leave it loose so they have room to finesse it from there? Keeping in mind not to step on anyone's toes, I've always erred on providing the editor with a more polished assembly if my time allowed for it because I'm trying to give them a better starting point uh, to get moving faster and the faster they can see whether a scene is working or not, the quicker they can polish it or completely restructure it if needed. In both the reality TV slash factual side but especially in scripted content, creating assemblies is a great opportunity to learn. You don't even need to bug the editor to teach you, because once you've handed over your cut, all you have to do is closely observe what the editor adds, removes, and changes to their own version. And while using different takes might seem like the only thing to observe, that's only the beginning. You can explore so many of the choices that they make. Did they use a different opening or closing shot? What was the impact of that? Did they remove dead air? Did they add a pregnant pause? Did they cut away from a character when a line was being said? Is the entire scene a lot longer or shorter? And what is the effect of that pacing change? Take a humble step back and figure out why their changes are an improvement on your edit. And let's be honest, nine times out of 10, it absolutely will be. And then the next time you're given the chance to assemble, keep these creative choices in mind. As a last point in scripted content, an editor may hand you one of their sequences early on and ask you to complete an SFX or music pass. And that's just to help them flesh out the edit because they gotta move on to keep up with camera. Again, this is a great opportunity to take a close up look at their timeline and learn something from it. Now let's talk about exports. An export or an output is simply sharing the work from within the NLE so that the other key creative partners can view and share their feedback. You export from Avid and upload to whatever viewing platform the production is working from, like Frame.io or Vimeo. Sometimes exports are simply referred to as QTs, which stands for QuickTime, because QuickTime.mov files are the most common export file format that is made. There are exports or outputs at every step of the edit, because it's critical to keep the creative key partners, like the directors and producers, in the loop all along. It's also important to make sure that you only send it to those who are cleared for a specific stage. For example, only the director is allowed to watch the editor's cut because it would be unfair for the producers to watch it and then make judgments about the director's work when the director hasn't even had the chance yet to course correct the edit or put their own spin on it. Now, an export is more than just clicking a few buttons and uploading. You're expected to ensure that the export is fully representative of what's on the editor's timeline. Colors have to look the same, the effects have to come across, and the sound should, well, sound the same uh, the way that the editor has mixed it. It would be wise to conduct a few tests with the lead assistant editor to determine what the workflow is or if any fixes are needed. 
you'll probably be adding a slate at the top of the timeline, which shows the project title, the episode number, the cut version, date, and total runtime, as well as any other uh, necessary notes. And you will also be adding time code to the entire sequence so that when feedback is given, it can be pointed to an exact moment. After you have made the export, it is expected that the assistant will quality control or QC the file. And that means watching the entire cut from beginning to end. You are closely watching for any glitches, mistakes, dropped frames, VFX or render errors, or any typos. And this can certainly feel like a chore at times, but it is necessary. You don't want a mistake to reflect poorly on the editor, the director, or the producer who is sharing their work with their boss, whatever level that might be. You should follow the conventions that your lead assistant editor or post supervisor have established. Usually they will figure out the exact specs that are needed, which may be limited by the online storage or platform choice. They should have, hopefully, set up a labeling convention as well that you really should adhere to. With so many exports being shared, you want an organized way to keep track of them all. So usually you'll have something like show title initials underscore cut version underscore date. And usually the QuickTime is just a 1920 by 1080p uh, H.264 at around the five megabits per second bitrate. So this would be an example of a output being prepped for the paper edit assembly. Um, and here is the actual export window in Avid um, that gives you all the options to select those specs. I do leave uh, the full specs listed in the text version of this course, but uh, it's all pretty straightforward and your lead assistant should be telling you the exact specs by the time you get to the export stage. So I wouldn't worry just yet if you're unsure of the exact choices you should be making. The last thing I'll say about exports is that the milestone exports, the ones that are being shared with the network executives, um, they carry a lot of pressure for the editor and the key creatives involved because um, this is the point where their work is being opened up now for judgment. And they're usually racing against the clock to get the best product made down to the hour at the end of the day. So just be mindful of that. And unfortunately, this usually means that the assistant editor will be handed a timeline to export near the end of the editor's workday. So it's not uncommon to have to stay late to see this export completed. Um, but your post supervisor should be able to plan accordingly with you so that you are hopefully never caught by surprise um, by this request, because it will happen a lot. So that technically brings us to the end of the assist section um, of responsibilities, but there is one that's sort of ongoing, and that is being tech support for your editor. Assistants sort of have this funny position of being both, you know, more green or less experienced uh, than their editors, but the weird thing is that your editors will look to you as experts in workflow and especially in the software. So my, my main point of advice there is to get really good at Googling uh, solutions because essentially your editor will pop into your room and ask for a favor and you will say, yeah, I'll figure that out right away. And then you start looking through the Avid forums, the Reddit posts and whatnot to quickly get to an answer that solves the problem for them. Um, no one expects that you will know everything on your first day, but you are expected to find the solution as quickly as possible. So you've ingested all the footage, you've assisted your editor, and they have finally hit picture lock. This may feel like cause for celebration, and it is, but when an episode or film hits picture lock, the assistant's workload really cranks up again. And there will be a crunch to pass off all the necessary elements and media to the different teams so that they can get working on it as soon as possible. In a sense, the project is starting the final leg of the journey, the online edit. And it's extremely helpful to know what to expect before you start this process for the first time. So I'm gonna break down conform or prep for conform into three steps. The timeline cleanup, the turnover elements, and the relink, or the online edit. Editors can leave behind a mess. It may be because of the sheer amount of episodes, the frantic pace to keep up, or just the personal way they work on their timelines. 
but the final sequence that the editors hand over to you is never fully organized the way it needs to be. Ideally, it's close and easy to parse, but regardless, it's the assistant's job to tidy up, label, and arrange all the tracks to be as streamlined as possible. Here's an example of a pretty neat sequence I made while on my editor's cut. If I handed this over to an assistant today to prepare for the conform, they would first collapse all the video clips onto V1, with exceptions for VFX. What this means is bringing down all the clips that are uh, on V2 and above and overwriting any of the clips that were not used below. Secondly, they would commit the multicam edits. That means taking those group clips and removing the other angles from it. And then we have the organization of the production audio, the sound effects, and the music. These three elements should all be on their own dedicated tracks. Lastly, you'd be adding all the notes. The notes indicate VFX shots, ADR placements, Chiron or lower thirds, and sometimes even color notes as well. So here's a look at the picture lock sequence. Um, specifically on V2 and 3, you can see all the other shots uh, either got brought down and then overwrote what was underneath on V1 so that you're only keeping exactly what is supposed to be seen on the timeline. There's no additional shots that are hidden below or behind another shot. Again, the one exception being if there's a VFX shot or some sort of uh, dissolve or superimposition that needs uh, two layers to be carried across. You can also see that the SFX and the music uh, got completely uh, separated very cleanly. I also have two um, muted tracks there, the gray bars right across, just to visually create that separation as well. Doing this, uh, well, one, allows you to see all the elements and track down every uh, piece of media that was used. But two, um, this will become very handy in a later step when you're sending off separate elements. Since this is the offline edit, there's still loads of work to be done. And this picture lock is the reference moving forward. So it's for that reason that this offline cut includes the notes of the final pieces that are still to be added. So every VFX shot will need to be noted on screen with a small description of what that VFX will be. Every ADR line will be noted, that is the lines that need to be re-recorded, and every lower third as well, and sometimes even the color notes. And you can see I've put my VFX notes and my ADR notes on V5 and V6. Now to be clear, the notes are visible on the cut as well as on the timeline. And usually a, an assistant will add markers to the endpoint of an ADR note or VFX note so that afterwards they can easily make a list uh, of the time code accurate uh, placements of these notes. It's important that you take your time organizing the final picture lock sequence. Since it serves as the basis for all the departments moving forward, you need to make sure that it is accurate down to the frame. And if another revision is made at the 11th hour, you'll be glad you can pinpoint the exact time code the changes need to take place. Again, once the picture is locked, the edit will need to be sent to various departments. Turnover refers to the assets or the deliverables or the elements that are being shared with these other departments. The assistant editor is in charge of overseeing this process, not the editor. If you're working with an all-in-one post facility, then they will provide a deliverables or turnover list with the exact specs needed for each element but usually you can expect the following items to be requested. Now, I apologize for the wall of text that's about to pop up, making this look like every middle schooler's PowerPoint presentation, but uh, you can obviously refer to the list of things in the text version of this lesson, but just so that you have a quick overview of what is expected in the turnover, which is sometimes a fair bit, uh, we're gonna quickly go through it now. So basically there's two sets of elements that you're providing. The first is for a picture and the second is for audio. To start, you'll create a final set of exports of the cut. This export is usually referred to as the QT reference and you're gonna export it in Apple ProRes or DNX HD, uh, usually at HD resolution with burn in timecode. This will have all the final notes for ADR, VFX and color and you'll have the proper slate and the two pop 
which are those color bars and that beep that happens two seconds before the first frame of content. And this QuickTime reference will serve as the blueprint for everyone to refer back to what the online and finished cut is supposed to look like. Next, you have the Avid bin, which contains the final sequence and the final sequence only. In case you didn't know it, you can share an Avid bin. Uh, a bin is an actual file in your file explorer or your Mac finder. Unlike Premiere and Final Cut, where their bins are sort of built into the software, an Avid bin is an actual file. Third on the list, we have the AAF file or an EDL, sometimes both. And EDL is uh, kind of an older format now, but the AF is um, the AF is now the standard, and it can both be a map of how the cut is laid out, but in addition to that, it can also um, contain the media that's used in the cut. So you can have that media embedded inside the AF file, and so you wouldn't need to separately send a bunch of the camera files or the audio files that you used. Uh, that does make it quite a bloated file, though, if you do it that way. And then next on the list, we have a, a list itself of all the timeline effects, the resizes, the crops, the flips and flops, the speed ramps, um, and their time code that they appear at. Um, and this is just, most of that stuff will carry over into the online cut without you doing anything, but it is important to have it documented. Next, you'll have a list of all the VFX shots, which will include a unique name for each one of them, or identifier for each one of them, um, a description, the time code that they appear in the sequence, and the time code of the source or the high-res clip that will be needed to be worked on. And lastly, you should be supplying any non-standard fonts that were used in the show's lower thirds or credit sequences. Now, for reality TV, there is an additional item and this is a blurs list. Um, for any non-cleared logos or people who, who do not give their consent, uh, their faces or those logos will need to be blurred out by the online editor. And so the online editor will need a list of all the instances that those logos or those faces appear in the cut. All right, and then we move on to the audio elements. The audio teams, which would be your sound editors and mixers, and your composer, if you have one, they'll also need the QuickTime reference, um, usually in the same format, except the audio itself will be structured in a slightly different way. That is to say, it will be a split track QuickTime. And that means you'll be panning some of the audio either fully to the right channel or fully to the left channel, depending on the type. So for instance, for the sound mixers, and the editorial team, um, the dialogue will usually be set solo to the right channel and the music and SFX will be only on the left channel. And this way they can turn off the, you know, extra sounds of the music, the music soundscape and the sound effects and just listen to the production audio or the dialogue. Um, for the composer who would want to try out their own music, you would have the dialogue and the sound effects paired together on the right channel and you would have just the music soloed on the uh, right on the left channel and that way they could listen to the music turn it off and then they can try their own piece of music set to the scene and still hear the dialogue and the sound effects coming through to the sound editorial team you will be sending an AAF file as well and this time it will be an embedded file so it'll contain all the audio that's used plus usually a 20 second handle, which means 20 seconds additional material off the top and 20 seconds additional material on the tail end as well. However, you will also be providing all the original sound files and the sound reports as well. And this allows the sound editors to find other options or use bits and pieces for creative solutions. Next, you'll provide separate exports of the dialogue, the music, and the sound effects tracks as their own .wav files. And this allows the sound editors to, to hear exactly what was in each of these elements in the offline cut. And for the last two items, just like with the picture elements, you'll be providing a list of all the ADR notes. 
and that would mean which character needs to come in for re-recording a line and the dialogue that needs to be re-recorded or recorded for the first time. And you will also need to include a list of all the music cues, which is basically all the times there is a music track that's included in the edit. Now, if there is a change that happens after picture lock, which is bound to happen, uh, new QuickTime references should be created. In addition to that, you should make a changed list, which shows the exact time code that the change was made and what that change was. Lastly, we have the relink and the online, which allows us to see the edit in high resolution. In both scripted and reality TV, it is super common now to complete the conform through the services of a post facility. They likely transcoded and synced the camera originals, and so they will have them waiting in all their high res glory, waiting to be relinked. All they need are the turnover elements for the picture. But even if the transcodes were done in house or by yourself, it's still possible to have a post facility complete the relink. Because in addition to the turnover elements, you'd simply also provide the camera original footage as well. It's only on much smaller productions that the conforms are completed in-house. So unless you are joining a much lower budget show, you will not be overseeing this step. But it's always a good idea to know the premise of the workflow. Basically, you will return to the Avid Media Files folder and from within the MXF folder, you will take out all of the super well organized shoot day footage and you'll just bring it up a level. Doing so will make everything on your timeline turn red or go offline. But that's all right, because the way you transcoded your material, it's all been linked. So all you have to do is right click on your sequence and the and choose relink. Then the relink window will pop up and essentially you point it towards the original camera footage to be relinked. And that is how you would get the picture media back online. From there, you might make an intermediate transcode uh, at a higher quality to work off from. And then you would marry that with the audio files that would hopefully be worked on uh, by someone who has some capability of sound editing and sound mixing. I've included some more information on the text version of this lesson. But for a more in-depth tutorial, I would check out the link to the Avid resources. Okay, once you've exported the final online version and you have the you know perfect audio edited and mixed and the high-res picture media that's been relinked and it's all been married and now exported, uh, you're going to be preparing the final deliverable, aka the master file. And your client, the broadcaster or the network, will have a very detailed spec sheet that they will provide. Um, probably more detail than you've ever uh, been used to. Uh, but for example, you'll have the resolution, the frame rates, the file wrappers, the video encoding options, and you'll have um, the exact audio specifications that are requested as well, um, which includes the codec, the sample rate, and the bit depth, but also exactly how the channels need to be mapped, which is to say the first two are stereo left and right, the th three and four our music and effects left and right, the fifth is mono or narration, and so on and so on. It's very specific. Um, for an example, you can just jump on, on Google and look for Netflix delivery specs and you would see their example of exactly what they require. Again, a lot of this is now happening um, through a post facility or another vendor and not in-house. But if you did make the final, final deliverable in-house, you would have to QC it that means quality control and uh, double check all the specifications are met. Now that being said, even if you were doing this in-house, this is not really a job for a junior assistant editor to handle the online edit and the final deliverable. But I would highly recommend that you ask to shadow a lead assistant editor or the online editor just to learn if, if the time per permits. Because while you can learn the process outside of doing it, um, if you see exactly how the edit affects the final products, including how the lawyers have to chime in about clearances and whatnot, 
that's only going to make you a more informed editor when the time comes to be cutting yourself. And once you send off the final deliverable outside of project backups and um, organization for potentially next season, this is it. That's the job. So we've looked at those three main categories, right? We've looked at ingesting, which is bringing in the footage. We've looked at assisting, which is helping the editor piece it together. And we've looked at conforming, which is sending off the locked cut to be polished and um, to be relinked and polished. And this is the order of production. Um, but as you might have already guessed, there is significant overlap in each step. Um, it would be an extremely rare project to not begin the editing while production is still shooting. And it would also be quite rare to not involve the VFX teams way earlier so that they can inform the edit. It's not just A, B, and then C. It's kind of all happening at once. Um, so what does that mean for you? It means a lot of busy days. Most mornings you will probably start by ingesting the previous day's footage and you'll quickly group and sync the footage. You'll add the labels and descriptions using the script supervisor's notes. You'll double check that nothing fell through and then you'll organize it in the bin and pass it off to the editor. Then, or even simultaneously, you will have requests coming from the editor to create a string out of shots or complete a music or SFX pass on one of their scenes, you're gonna have to learn how to prioritize these tasks. Usually whatever an editor needs comes first to the top of your list. And while you will not be sending out an unfinished cut to get color treatment or sound mix, you will be making the lists of the VFX shots that are needed, the color notes, the ADR notes as well. And this allows everyone to be prepared and on the same page when it comes to the final step of the production. And of course, you'll be sending out exports all along the way to the key creatives to keep the other departments in check as well. Um, you might even be sending it to, on a TV show, you might even be sending the cuts to other editors just so they can see what are, what's happening on other episodes. So there are definitely seasons to the work on a project, and there's always going to be plenty to do. But if you do have some downtime, be proactive about finding another way to help. It will go a long way with your own career education and in showing your peers that you can handle more responsibility. That brings us basically to the end of the course, and I hope that's been helpful to see the outline or the structure of exactly what the day-to-day -day job is of the assistant editor. But for next steps, I would especially focus on building up these skills the ingest and the avid media management, those are skills that would make you immediately employable. And if you do get a job, um, even as a logger or a post PA, just shadow the lead assistants as much as possible and definitely show your gratitude um, for their time. Now, keep learning and practicing the storytelling and editing ability too. I, I don't mean to say that you should only focus on the technical aspects of editing. You should keep an eye towards the storytelling because you never know when the opportunity will present itself for you to go up to bat and, and take a chance on, on cutting a scene. And maybe that new technique you learned about how to do a rotoscope or how to rotoscope a little bit better or faster, maybe that'll come in handy. Definitely keep an eye toward the artistic tools of the trade, even as you just work on um, mastering the technical aspects too. And lastly, be aware of building up your soft skills too. Being an editor and being in the edit room requires a whole suite of non-technical talents. You gotta learn how to read the room, how to engage people diplomatically, uh, to, to know how to bring peace to a director who's really stressed out from their last day on set and is coming to you to know that the cut is going to work out. Um, these are all skills you gotta pick up over time and it's not easy because you're not really sure of what you're missing, but um, those are all things where if you as an assistant can shadow your editor, you'll really pick up that they have this whole hidden toolkit behind them. And that is the social aspect or the soft skills aspect of editing. And lastly, on getting that first job, just take whatever first opportunity uh, presents itself to you, whether that's a logger or a post PA, that's okay. Get your foot in the door and once you're in without being pushy you can make it clear that you are ready to go above and beyond 
and help out the post team with any additional tasks, especially since you are now familiar with the workflow. Stay humble. It's really easy to think you're above whatever that first job is, especially when you're being paid peanuts to work on it. Just remember that you're proving yourself to everyone there and you're creating a record of credibility. Um, so enjoy the small victories and um, celebrate you with your peers at the at the rap parties and you know show the show pride in the work that you're you're making it's going to be a long career journey so you might as well enjoy it every step of the way